Hello to all of you who are watching the show right now. My name is Nella Fahadayat and you are watching the Women in Development uh, discussion that we are having today. I am the moderator of this discussion for the next 60 minutes. And hopefully we have an exciting, invigorating and rejuvenating discussion that we're gonna have with you. The topic of today's uh, seminar is, can bad leaders incite good change? Can bad leaders incite good change? It's a very provocative question, but it's pertinent because of the time that we are living in now as women of the world. Now, in a moment, I'm going to be joined by my many, by my four panelists who uh, have many expertise and, and many uh, experiences in this field, um, both personal and, of course, in the work that they do. And I'm hoping to draw on their expertise, on their knowledge, and, of course, their strength, because these are not easy times that we're living through. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you. And as I introduce you, if you could just give a little wave so we know who is in each box. I've done these before and no one knows who anyone is. So we don't have little cards or anything. We're just going to have to make do. Catherine Oseta works with Women First Digital and Safe to Choose in Kenya, counselling young girls on their reproductive health. Dr. Zara Ahmad is the Associate Director of Federal Issues at the Guttmacher Institute, where she develops strategies to advance and strengthen sexual and reproductive health rights around the world. We've also got Sarah Sippel, who is the President of Change and a Commissioner for the International AIDS Society Lancet Commission on the Future of Global Health and HIV Response. And last but by no means least is Dr. Lina Abirafa. She's the executive director of the Arab Institute for Women and a She Decides representative. Lina spent over 20 years in development and gender-based violence prevention in many countries, including my home country of Afghanistan, in Haiti, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Nepal. You are all welcome to this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, I've spoken briefly about your expertise and what you will do, and we have a wealth of knowledge in front of us for the next 15 minutes, but the, the, the question at hand deserves some, some uh, setting out. So, leadership like that of Donald Trump and his administration has decimated global progress on women's health, equality, and empowerment. And this has been done through policies that have directly impacted women in countries far from the US. It's also galvanized resistance in the form of you four and others watching this webinar. We're grateful to you for your time today. And it's pushed for positive change. Now, the Trump administration is a target, a scenario that has focused and united women around the world and inspired the formation of millions of strong organizations, million strong organizations to push more aggressively for progression and progress on women's health, equality, and empowerment. That's our aim. How are we going to get there? That's the topic of this agenda for this discussion. By the end of the event, we want to get to the point that there needs to be radical change in order to transform funding practices in the international development sector. And the Trump administration's determination and their detrimental influence underscores that dire need. Funding needs to reach the women working and driving progress at the community level. Now I've set the scene, you know who our speakers are, it's time to begin. So my first question to all of you will require a one minute response, if you can keep it that short. Um, and we've got loads of questions to get through. So, so let's begin. Uh, how has the Trump administration, Lena, impacted women's access to reproductive health rights? Well, it's worth stating that this administration is anti-choice, anti-women, anti-rights, anti just about everything that we believe in. So what it's done is severely damage uh, sexual reproductive health and rights, restricting access, setting back efforts, defunding critical programs that are life-saving. So we've put women's bodies and lives at risk. We've put them on the line. And this compromises their lives in all other sectors too. It's not just about health. It's about, in the end, their access to education and employment and their participation participation in public and political life. So everything is compromised and it's got massive spillover effects. So we are going to be dealing with this actually for years to come, undoing the mess that has been made and the damage. Undoing the mess that has been made, Dr. Zara. That's very powerful words. What do you make of it? 
Absolutely. This, as Lena said, is a decades long disaster. So I want to talk about a specific issue that applies both in the US and globally that doesn't seem quite so obvious, and it's the failure to support sexual and reproductive health during the COVID-19 pandemic. So even before the pandemic, there was this huge unmet need for sexual and reproductive health services with more than 218 million women of reproductive age around the world with an unmet need for modern contraception. There were 35 million unsafe abortions every year, 13 million newborns born with major complications who don't get the care they need. And even still, with all that information, the, this administration kept trying to zero out funding for global health programs, including family planning. And then comes along the pandemic and things go from bad to worse. So back exactly. in April, our team modeled the impact of this, shared our estimates, which I can talk about later, with the Trump administration and pushed them to provide money and support for global programs, showing that this crisis has multi-generational implications, as Lena said. But their anti-science, anti-woman ideology prevented them from using this evidence to take action and invest in the critical systems. So now we've gone from a from a dire problem to a full-blown global global so, crisis. Uh, I'm gonna thank you, Dr. Zara, and I cannot wait to come to you specifically because we have uh, panel-specific questions that will be interspersed with our larger discussion. But Catherine, I have to come to you because I saw you nodding your head there. Uh, do you agree that the Trump administration is in fact using? this global pandemic to further restrict women's rights, which seems quite macabre. Sure, sure. And um, let me say uh, the, the, the trans administration has really put women into a lot of uh, risks. And uh, we see uh, in, in, when I talk about the African perspective and especially where I, I am right now in Kenya, we are having a lot of unsafe abortions uh, because women are unable to access services and quality healthcare. And uh, let me say this has really brought a lot to women. And we also see um, other anti-abortion uh, anti uh, groups coming and even attacking people who are supporting women to access services. So that's so the, so the access physically is being uh, is being uh, removed. So uh, coming to you next, uh, uh, Sarah, what are the, these restrictions and limitations? If you can, in, a mo in one minute, tell me what are these, the impact, what is the impact of the administration on simply access to reproductive health rights? Yeah, no, th thank you. Thank you, Nilifar. And, and to your first question, like about what this, the impact on our work. I mean, so change is based in the United States. We advocate for sexual reproductive health and rights by holding the US government accountable to its global commitments. And this is a government that there's no accountability. So it's been very strenuous on our work. Um, but I think the restrictions, you know, the global gag rule is like the one that looms above all of, all of our work, um, which he and the Trump administration, not only do they reinstitute it, they expanded it. So and for, what our, it for our viewers who are watching, uh, 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 Sarah, could you just explain what the, the, the global gag law is? Absolutely, absolutely. The global gag rule, it restricts overseas non-governmental organizations from receiving U.S. funding for for family for well now it's all global health for any global health projects that you can it restricts you from referring providing counseling or advocating for abortion as a method of family with your non-U.S. money so it's not a policy that impacts organization the U.S. money it's saying if you take U.S. money you cannot use your money that you get from the Swedish government or from a private foundation that, and so it has a, a detrimental effect, a chilling effect, because it really silences organizations, providers from even doing what they're allowed to do. So what I'm hearing, Sarah, is that, that access is being limited, not only at, at, on, a, on a physical level, when you're trying to get to these reproductive health centers and, and to access those rights that you should have fundamentally, uh, as Catherine was alluding to, but the money's not there. So let's move on. Lena, let me come back to you. She decides was born in response to the global gag rule, right? What, what Sarah was just mentioning. Has bad leadership, has a, a bad administration. I mean, let's face it, the United States uh, is the global leader. They, they set precedents, they set the bar and the rest of the world follows. So can we say that, that, uh, that it is bad leadership has stoked the flames of the women's movement 
can something as catastrophic as the Trump administration be helpful to us in this sense? Tough question, I know, but I want an answer. You have about three minutes. Not a tough question because there's always been a flame and there's always been a women's movement and there's always been feminism and it's been everywhere. Did we need bad leadership to remind us of that? Absolutely not. We would never advocate for that. And anyway, it's not just bad leadership that exists in a vacuum. It's a reflection of bad policies. And this also has a support base. It's not about one individual. You know, we tend to center it on this one character, a loathsome character, no doubt, but this just doesn't spring up on its own like a mushroom. The idea with bad leadership is it works works against all the priorities and the values that we have, equality, opportunity, uh, empowerment, choice, voice yeah, for women, yeah, everything. Let me, back, Nina, but, let me push back a little bit because we, we both, I mean, there is no one on this panel here that I can see that will disagree with you. But the reality right. can sometimes be hard to accept, which is to say, let me use myself as an example. I've called myself a feminist all my life. I'm an Afghan born British citizen. And I've seen what, what, what access I have here in the developed world versus what my cousins have in Afghanistan. And I was very, I was a lazy feminist. I'm not gonna lie. I was a completely lazy feminist. You feel free to laugh at me, it's true. Now with Donald Trump, I was there in New York at that march. I was there, I felt the kinship and solidarity. It did stoke fire and, uh, and flame under me. So I'm just talking largely, especially with the work that you do with She Decides. Do you think that, that this has been an inadvertent effect? She Decides was ignited, yes, in response to one specific political decision, but the concept has existed and now it's grown into so much more and it's always been needed. You know, the idea of she decides for me is a no brainer. It doesn't, it shouldn't be a battle cry. It should be obvious. Talk to right now, I cover the Arab region. I talk to Arab women and I say, she decides and they say, oh my goodness. And I say, well, you know, he decides for himself and they say, yeah, absolutely. That's right. And I say, well, no, what is the difference fundamentally? So, you know, are we continuing to wake up to become more aware to to become more angry, to become more active, and to channel all that into some concrete change? Absolutely. But, you know, did it take this? Did it need all of this? I feel like we've been fighting for our rights for years, forever. And how much longer do we want it fighting? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nina Abirafa. So the question now for all of you, and we're going to do the, the, the hot fire round, sticking to a minute, I insist. Uh, this time, let's start with Dr. Uh, uh, let's start with Dr. Zara Ahmed. Do you think that Trump's policies and political ideology has um, invigorated women's movements or fueled localized donations? So are we talking about big macro change or we're we talking about smaller changes on the ground? Which one do you think is, is, is happening? Well, I don't think it's a binary. You know, I think you've got to do both of these things. So I come from a background in global health security. And in that realm, we talk about this cycle of panic and neglect. So right now we're in this moment of panic with the women's movement, right? There's this wave of panic and I'm really proud of the way we've all come together to fight back, but I quite frankly am terrified what will happen when the imminent threat from the White House isn't there. Will we move to the neglect stage? So we know we can't take the foot off our gas and assume things will move forward. You know, as we've all, we've all said, progress on women's issues isn't automatic and we have to fight for every inch. Mm. And in some ways being reactive to the big bad threat is galvanizing and energizing and sexy. But on the flip side, to your point, LFR, being proactive and doing the daily work, even when the attention in, isn't on, is grueling and even tougher. So while I think we've done a great job mobilizing on the global and local scales right now in response, I'm not sure that we've mobilized for the long-term fight and keeping everybody focused and engaged over the decades of battles to come. But I, but I don't think up, it's too late for us to do that. Dr. Zara, let me follow up. Let's talk about the last four years, right? When, when uh, the Trump administration came to be, that we knew that there was going to be a very hard line, a very Christian take on any policies that were going to govern women's bodies or their right to access safe sexual health and women's health care. What has happened in the last four years that has set us back? As you mentioned previously, 10 years, you said that this is, gonna, this is a 10 year degradation of women's rights. What has happened in the last four years that, that, that you think has made that even harder for us to build on come uh, January, 2021? Yeah, I think we've seen at first the, the um, 
the expansion of policies like the global gag rule, taking it further than it's ever been, and this massive chilling effect on all of the partners, on local health systems, on foreign policy writ large, on people being afraid to talk to their clinician about services they might want. There's this massive effect at every level of the system. We've also seen repeated attacks on the funding for this work and demonizing it and saying that these are not essential services when we know that they're life-saving in and of themselves. So there's a myriad of ways, both in the US and globally, that this administration has painted a target on the back of, of women, quite frankly, yes. and said, we're gonna come after you for political points. So, you know, above all else, just the politicization of reproductive health, women's health, is a thing that we're gonna have to be undoing for decades to come. Catherine, can I come to you briefly? This is very cheeky of me. I'm not sure my producer would approve, but but because you're there, you're on the ground, you're talking, you, you mentioned things that really, you know, I'm, I'm still processing what you said about people physically removing a woman's right to access, access some of these centers and some of these basic rights that they have. So let me put that question to you. Do you, do you think that um, in a sense that the movement has creates a patterns of behavior now that are, that are acceptable now, uh, where four years ago they wouldn't have been? Yes, uh, I will say yes, uh, because um, I'm on the ground and uh, on the ground, especially in the rural Kenya, I see a lot of things happening. Uh, when it comes to a woman not being able to access to services and young girls, and not only services, but even uh, information. But um, through this, I've seen a lot of women coming together in terms of advocacy and trying to fight for the rights of women, coming and forming groups whereby women are able to um, maybe have a chance or have a safe space on how they can counterattack the rule on you know, um, this thing of women being hindered to access to uh, quality services. And we see uh, through these groups where women are coming together, uh, they are really trying to uh, make women access issues on gender equality and access the comprehensive sexuality education. And I feel um, uh, maybe um, even, even though the, 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 the gag rule is there, but if women are able to continue coming together in powerful movements, then uh, maybe in the coming years we can counterattack these movements, yeah, these kind of uh, rules. Sarah, you are nodding vigorously. I can't but come to you, please. And 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 uh, all my panelists, please feel free if you have something to say, if you want to comment on each other's points, interrupt them or interrupt me, please. I, I urge you. Otherwise, it's just me asking you questions, and that's not really how a conversation is had. So let's just get to Sarah because you were just nodding. I could I could see from the corner of my well, eye. I think this coming together of women's groups and people across sectors has been really amazing. As Lena was saying, you know, feminists, we've been doing this, some of us have been doing this for decades, fighting day to day. And I think what's different now with Trump, he's, he's put a spotlight on women's issues in a way that people can't turn away anymore. And so we've had, right after the Women's March, we were so energized, change. we organized a march from Freedom Plaza to the White House, people chanting against the global gag rule. We had 40 organizations sponsoring from climate change, human rights, reproductive justice, on the global gag rule. And then we have more than a thousand people marching. So what it's done is it's brought together people because it's so egregious what this administration has done, expanding the global gag rule to all global health. So HIV AIDS groups, water issues, water aid, groups that never have touched this issue before have really come on board and are seeing it, not just for their issue, but as a women's rights bodily autonomy issue. And I want to add two examples of this, this, it's so extreme that we have two things that are happening now that four years ago would have been laughable. One is the Helms Amendment, which is a US law that um, it restricts funding, no US funding can pay for abortions overseas as a method of family planning. We would never even have advocates. I've been doing this work for, for, for 20 years. It was like, it was embarrassingly so status quo. We, we all believe we're never gonna be able to move on Helms. We introduced a law this year to repeal the Helms Amendment and it will be re reintroduced last next year. This is historic, it's never been done before. The other thing we have is a proposal for US feminist foreign policy. We talked about this over the past few years and then finally last year some of us got to get, we were like, we just got to do it. Let's just put just it out. Get on with it. What is the Sweden's done it, Canada. And so again, it's laughable. 
but we have a resolution introduced in Congress that saying yes to a US feminist foreign policy. Well, so what's laughable, I think, is that we haven't thought of it yet. So thank the Lord for people like you who have. Can I just ask you to talk to us a little bit about the Global Her Act? What is that and why are you uh, uh, wanting to, to, to kind of push it through? Is that for me? Or, so, because I know Sarah's also working on this. So the Global Her Act, well, it's with permanent, we permanently repeal the global gag rule. So we've had it go back and forth between presidents, Democrat presidents, you know, take it out, Republicans put it back in. We need a Congress, we need a law that says that ends the global gag rule once and for all. And that is what the, the Global Her Act would do. And we have more sponsors than any other time in history. Um, it's gotten through the, the house. And so um, we'll see what happens after the elections. Um, and so it's, it's an exciting moment, again, because things are so awful, because it hasn't been expanded across all global health and it's impacting LGBTQ people as well. So we have a really solid, wide coalition of organizations and people who care about this and want this global gag rule to end once and for all. So uh, for those of you who are watching now, this is uh, uh, Will to Sarah, who's asking, can, I, can we share this recording? I am positive that we can share this recording. This needs to go out. We're about to have a brand new foreign policy department coming up in America. This is exciting times. Catherine, I'd like to come to you next, if I might. Um, how has, has the organization that you, that you represent and work for, Safe to Choose, so how has, has Safe to Choose the services been impacted? And I, I think you, you mentioned a little bit about the physical nature of that and the practical nature of it, but I wanna understand psychologically and also in terms of support, you know, the morale of, of the people working in the sector, how has it been affected by the anti-abortion foreign policies of the US? Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me say uh, Women First Digital has three platforms. One platform is safe to choose, how to use abortion pill and find my method. So um, from the three platforms, women are able to access the platforms all over the world, as long as they can, they have access to internet and a gadget that can, can connect to internet. So we find a lot of women, uh, uh, um, uh, I mean, a lot of women uh, approach or uh, visit our website on uh, access to information, access to how to use uh, abortion pills, and also um, where they can access uh, the services all over the world. So not only Kenya, but all over the world. And you find we serve women uh, uh, through the different languages. And um, when women are coming to our platforms, they come accessing where they can uh, get these pills or where they can access uh, in, in, in clinic services, wherever they are. And what we do at, at uh, Safe to Choose, we really try our best to support these women with uh, information, correct information, and um, where they can access the services, and more so what they should, what, they should know what uh, to do when they're through within the process. But I guess mm -hmm. what I want to, Catherine, what I want to kind of encourage you to, to talk about is, and for the rest of us to learn about really, is there have been backlashes towards uh, abortion and, and abortion service provision in Kenya before. The mm -hmm. anti-abortion foreign policies of the US cannot have helped that. So I want mm -hmm. to know the sentiment of the people of Kenya who are trying to use safe to choose. Uh, uh, is that being affected? I want to know if, if that's happening. Okay, so uh, since Safe to Choose is an online platform, you'll find uh, women feel so free to access the platform without going through any stigma. And when they are referred, they are referred to providers who have consented with Safe to Choose on uh, giving women in, uh, support privately. Uh, and women are able to um, tap into these uh, partners who uh, uh, support them with uh, services in a very confidential way, and uh, they really access quality information. So these providers that we use are, um, are providers that are, um, they're not uh, open to the public so that I mean they, they can be, uh, maybe somebody can pinpoint them and say this person is providing services. So what what women come to us saying after we have referred them to these providers and because of the, of the gag rule, the effect of the gag rule is sometimes we refer them, but accessing to the services has been so hard. Like they can go, but they will not be able to access the pills. Or they'll be referred to another provider 
whom uh, whose services are a bit expensive. Ah, uh, so so because of the of the rule, yes. I want to bring in Dr. Zara at this point. Um, Do Dr. Zara, you obviously work in this in this space as well, but I want to talk about this idea of. The, the, to me, this moment feels very unique and different to when I've done these kind of sessions before. When I, and personally, in my life, when I've had to access sexual health care or when I've made documentary films about it, to me, this moment feels like a moment where either we are going to cross that Rubicon and actually have what we say we need to have, which is free and safe access for all womankind, wherever she may be, or not. So how does these anti-abortion foreign policies of the US exacerbate very traditional views? Or, I mean, Ka uh, Catherine mentioned uh, you can access it digitally. There's a massive digital gap between access to, to, to these devices and the internet between men and women in the first place. So I want to understand a little bit about the sentiment, that the, the mindset that these kind of anti-abortion, anti-women's health policies have. It can't be getting better. Yeah. They're not. And I want to underscore one point about bans on abortion. They don't stop abortion. They just stop safe, legal abortion. Unsafe abortion will continue. And in fact, there are 35 million unsafe abortions that happen around the world every year, leading to 23,000 women losing their lives. All of that is preventable. And in fact, we just did a big study that looked globally at rates of abortion by the legal status, and we found that the abortion rate is the same in countries where abortion is broadly legal and where it is not. Say and that again did, for us, for those, of, for those of us who weren't listening, say that one more time. That is incredible. The abortion rate is the exact same in countries where it is legal and where it is not legal. Exactly the same. That doesn't matter. What differs is the quality of care, people. It's the legality of care. It's the safety of care. That's the only thing that's different because people will always want and need abortions. There are 121 million unintended pregnancies every year, right? So we have to address this at all levels, whether that be meeting the gap for modern contraceptive needs, making sure that people have access to safe legal abortion services, that they have access to pregnancy related care, maternal health care, newborn care, the whole gamut. If you're actually going to talk about being pro-life, then you need to care about all of those elements because those are the activities, those are the programs that actually save lives. Thank you, Dr. Zara. At this point, I would like to welcome everybody who's tuned into this webinar. I know these are strange times and it's odd to see single people in little boxes, but I know you are as energized and as educated by a wonderful panelist as I am. I'd like to go around again and reintroduce you for those people who might have forgotten or have just joined us. Today, we are joined by Catherine Osata, working with Women First Digital and Safe to Choose in Kenya. She's counseling uh, young girls on their reproductive health. Hello, Catherine. We've got Dr. Zara Ahmed. She is the Associate Director of Federal Issues at the Gutmacher Institute, and she developed strategies to advance and strengthen sexual and reproductive health rights around the world. We are also very happy to be joined by Sarah Sipple. She is the President of Change and a Commissioner for the International AIDS Society, Lancet commissions on the future. She also commissions on the future of global health and HIV response. And Dr. Lina Abirafa is the executive director of the Arab Institute for Women and a She Decides representative. You are all very welcome. Right, now that we've all gone around and refreshed ourselves, this is another big question. And this is my favorite question. In fact, I asked one of our organizers, Stephanie, to put this as high up as possible. Ivanka Trump launched a Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative. Uh, very early on in the administration, and which sought to reach 50 million women and increase economic participation. Doesn't that ultimately help women in developing countries, Catherine? Do you think Ivanka Trump cares about the development uh, of women in these countries? In uh, one minute, please. I know you can talk for hours. In one minute. <laughs> Okay, what I'll say is you empower me economically, but you don't allow me to, uh, to, 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 you don't care about my choice, then I don't think that economic uh, empowerment will work for me. If today I'm going to have 10 children and I'm having a work pay that is giving me $50 in a month, how am I going to take care of these 10 children? So can we start by our choices first? Can we start by what can a woman do to be economically empowered? having a managed family can work. Absolutely. A woman 
Exactly. So that is what I'll, I'll say on that. <laughs> I, I, I hear you loud and clear. Let's go to you, Dr. Lena. You were nodding as well. Um, Ivanka Trump, some would argue that this is a very white savior mentality, that you go to these countries and you say, here's some prosperity, <laughs> and it sorts everything out. But I want to know, exactly. let's get really practical here. So she says, by launching Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative, that 50 million women have in the last four years been helped uh, in, in terms of economic prosperity. Is she right? Well, at the Arab Institute for Women, we're not involved, and she decides is not involved. I would doubt highly that she is right. Again, as Catherine says, our rights are not divided. You cannot separate our bind of dirty money. It comes with a value system that is in opposition to what we believe. So we're strapped for resources. I mean, that's a reality. And that's been a reality even before the gag rule, even before this administration. We are always fighting for money and we never actually get what we really need. So the challenge is. Do we take that money and accept the consequences or do we refuse the money, take a moral high ground, which is very difficult because you're putting women's lives further at risk and stay true to your values? These are the constant tensions that we have. And I want to ask us, why do we have to choose? Why can we not have the right kind of resource decide finally what to do with our bodies and our lives? Why do we have to choose? Why can't we have the right resources to decide what to do with our bodies? For those of you who couldn't hear that connection, Dr. Lena making an a perfect point. Sarah, let me come to you. Did Ivanka Trump save 50 million women? Well, we have a we have a hashtag for her and her initiative, not without repro. A point like women's economic empowerment cannot happen without bodily autonomy, without reproductive health services, just as Lena and Catherine have said. And this administration has been relentless in its efforts to stop access to abortion, to reproductive health. And Ivanka Trump has played just as much a role in that as the other Trump advisors. So young, and, and just to say, so like, because she's a woman doesn't mean that she is exempt from being a part of this patriarchal misogynist agenda of this administration. She is high, a senior advisor. Um, and when we think about the young women who have died due to complications from unsafe abortion, places like Catherine was saying in Kenya, also in Malawi, um, Economic empowerment literally means nothing for women who die because of Ivanka and Donald Trump's global gag rule and other policies. That this is life and death consequences. And so I don't give her a pass on this at all. Dr. Zara. Absolutely. Nothing makes me personally angrier than women creating flimsy, supposedly women-centered initiatives to make themselves look better. This initiative, as others have said, makes no mention of sexual and reproductive health, and if women can't control their reproductive destiny, it's hard for them to control their economic future. Women and people of all genders are not just workers, and that's very much how this initiative sees them, as cogs in a corporate system. But I really want to talk about an important thing, which is, to Lena's point, the impact that could have been had this funding not been directed at a vanity project. So this initiative is funded at about $100 million for the first year. If that money was redirected to global family planning programs, which again, the Trump administration has repeatedly tried to zero out, more than 4.5 million women and couples could be reached with family planning services, 2 million unintended pregnancies could be prevented, a quarter million unplanned births, more than 670,000 unsafe abortions prevented, and more than 3,200 women's lives saved. Now think about each of those millions of women women and couples and how their economic futures could have been different had they had access to these programs rather than this vanity project. That's a really important point. Shall we, um, uh, uh, ladies on the panel today, try and answer Dr. Lena's question because it's one that's at the heart of this entire debate we're having where the bad leaders can, in some tangential way, catalyze positive change. So, Dr. Lina set out the question, we have to make a moral choice between accepting this money and the funding that is so limited, such little resources there is, but also in, in and by doing so, ago, accepting the position of the administration. 
who feels strongly about it, but please, please feel free to like jump into each other's conversations. You don't need to wait for me to ask a question. I know it's weird, but we're going to do it. Well, I think, I mean, I'll bring up, and this is, goes back to She Decides, which Lena is, is very involved in. Um, you know, it was great and it was, it boosted morale when the European government stepped up and said, we're going to fill the decency gap on U.S. global health funding because of the global gag rule. I mean, the reality is the U.S. government is such a strong player. The, the dollars are there. And so you have organizations where their budgets are 50%, more than 50% of their budget is U.S. funding. And so to have to decide between not taking U.S. funding, the Swedish government can't, can't fill that gap. Um, and so it is, I, and I think for me, meeting with the groups who are really given this Sophie's choice, um, and it really isn't a choice, and the, the pain in terms of um, not being able to provide the full services or information to their clients, um, it is a moral dilemma. And I think the important thing is making sure that we're not um, condemning or looking down on organizations who do make a decision to take the U.S. funding. And I think that's been a, an important lesson in all of this. And how do we work together differently? Because- Would you take it? it Sarah, would you take it? Would you take the- We funding? don't take U.S. funding. But would you, like if it came down to it? I mean, what would you? Um, it's, it's, it's a moral decision, I guess, that- we're it's, a, it's a moral it's decision. A no, I- really women. It's, it's a hard one. Yeah. I, yes, I, my organization has, we do not take U.S. funding because we are, we do advocacy and we don't want to have to be in a more, in, to make these kinds of decisions. And personally, no, I, we don't. And, you know, but it's like, but the dollars, Matt, I can say from my perch here in Washington, D.C., well, govern, other governments need to step up. They need to, the national governments need to put more money into family planning, into abortion access, and all those things. And that's easy for me to say from the United States of America, but, um, I respect but that, that's how we get around this. No, I absolutely respect you. Lena, please jump in. And Catherine, I'd like to come right. to you at some point as well. Jump in. I mean, I I made the point before, and it's it's important to make it again, that we've been scrambling for scraps even before the gag rule, right? So we have been given next to nothing. Uh, and I think that's already criminal. And what does the gag rule really mean? I mean, what happens when you're gagging these community organizations is that you're actively stripping away power and control from women and girls oh, and the like organizations that support them. There is a, to reinvigorate the services, rebuild trust, bring back access. I mean, this is something that has caused a colossal setback. And this, and the law is not enough in the end. It's so much more than that. So the work that we have to do didn't start with this administration, won't end if this administration ends, will continue regardless. And that's for She Decides and the Institute as well. The point is we've always had to fight like this and it is nothing short of humiliating and there's one more thing I want to say is that we keep talking about our backlash and pushing back against the pushback well if you keep pushing back against pushback you end up right where you started so we are not progressing we are not sustaining any of the gains we are not able to move forward we're reduced to, to begging to stay where we are to maintain status quo we're hardly able to tread water and it is criminal that is the reality of it, and I respect you very much for stating it as it is. It is not always about putting on a brave face. It's about knowing when to just call it as it is. Catherine, you look like you took a lot of that yeah. on board, please. Yeah, uh, I'll, 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 I'll add on what Lina, Dr. Lina has said, and women go through a lot. They struggle for the little resources that they have. And if we go ahead, limiting the, even the little resources that is there, limiting to the women, I feel it's not okay. Can we let women grab everything? Let us not have boundaries for these women. So I, I, I for my, myself and my partner organizations, I'm not in for the, the dollars whereby I'm, I'll, 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 I'll tell a woman, I'll do this for you, but I'll not give you the information. I'll give the information, but I'll not refer you. I, you're not helping that woman. 
But do you think that if you were, if you, I'm, I'm going to ask you a tough question. If you, if you had to choose between getting that money and knowing the conditions or the, or the yes. uh, theology that comes behind it, would you take it? Catherine? Yes, sorry, I, I had a problem with my, uh, my internet, sorry, come again. No. I was just asking you because you are on the ground, you are working with local people. This is it's 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 a very much a frontline operation you're running. Do you accept that 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 you have to be morally ambivalent in order to accept the money, the resources, the limited that there are, irrespective of what moral baggage it might come with? Let me tell you, you know, sometimes um you can be given a bag of uh, a bag of uh, million dollars in a bag. I mean, a bag, a, a sack of millions inside it. But when you pick it, you're not satisfied. Why? Why are you not satisfied? It means there is something that you're not being given. Let me tell you. I wish you were here in Kenya. You see how women are struggling to access sexual reproductive health services. Where a woman goes to a clinic and she's told, "We don't have contraceptives today. Come tomorrow." What is this woman going to do between today and tomorrow? You see, that one makes me feel women are being, it's like pushing them in a, a hole and they've already been pushed and you're pushing them more and more and more and more and they have nothing to do. So as, as people who can, who can speak on their behalf, let us stand up and let us give these women that opportunity to have a space on where they can access all what they want in the community. They need to be involved even in decision making and make and making choices for themselves. So yeah, that is that is what I can say. I think fu fundamental to this conversation, and Catherine, I really appreciate what you're saying. I mean, what we're talking about is this neo-colonialism going on in our foreign aid structures and systems, whether it's the US government or the European nations, that it is just there, it is so um, disempowering um, and is really offensive in terms of that we have to have this conversation about making choices about taking money with strings attached and this conditionality of aid. And we, it really needs to be flipped on its head and it really needs to start with what do women need? And the funder, the government, the foreign aid are should be responding to what the women need, not what the US government thinks women need, or even with the Swedish or Dutch governments with all the good work they do still, I mean, what do women need? And then, and that's what we need to center the people who are the beneficiaries of this assistance to really have a say in what's being funded, how much is being funded and where it's being funded. Dr. Zara. I'm going to come to you now. We're moving on. That was, I think, incredibly interesting and and an, an eye-opening question that you guys answered there, brought on by Dr. Lena. Dr. Zara, what is the cost, if we're moving on the discussion now, projecting into the future, what is the cost of the package of essential sexual and reproductive health care that could be provided to all of women in LMICs? And how could the US elections change that? How could it impact this funding? Sure. So I mentioned earlier that there are huge gaps in access to sexual and reproductive health services, including the 218 million women in low and middle income countries with an unmet need for modern contraception. And, and the good news is that it's possible to address these gaps. Right. And it, doing so would have a huge return in terms of uh, if we met all of those needs, a two thirds decline in unintended pregnancies, unsafe abortions, maternal deaths and newborn deaths. So in terms of the cost, the total package for uh, all low and middle income countries is $69 billion per year, which may seem like a lot, but it translates to just $10.60 per person in low and middle income countries annually. And that's about $4.80 more than the current spending. So with that $10, the full package of essential sexual and reproductive health care could be provided to all women in low and middle income countries. So to make this happen, the U.S. has to do two things. So first, the US has to restore and scale up funding to UNFPA and fully re-engage with multilateral organizations, including the WHO, so that efforts on sexual and reproductive health are well-coordinated, well-funded, and well-implemented. So as people know, the Trump administration has withdrawn, congressional, withheld congressionally appropriated funds from UNFPA for the last four years and made it almost impossible for the US to partner on the ground with the agency. So uh, in addition, back in July, the administration began the process of withdrawing from the WHO, which is also heavily engaged in reproductive health. 
uh, a Biden administration would no doubt fully re-engage and reinvest in both of those critical institutions. The second thing in terms of funding, the US has to increase funding for its bilateral and multilateral global family planning and reproductive health. So the US does pay its share, fair share, which is about $1.6 billion per year. And now that may seem like, again, a lot of money, but it's about 0.2% of the US's annual discretionary defense budget. So we spent exponentially more on defense and the military than on this. And right now the US only pays about one third of its fair share, which is an abdication of its commitments and its leadership responsibility, but also a short-sighted failure given how much investments in global health benefit the US. So again, Congress has demonstrated a willingness to increase funding and the Biden team has stated that they have a commitment to global health, including reproductive health. So should we see a transition of power in January? There are a lot of positive signs for a change in policy. So, so, so can I just, just very briefly, I'm being told we're running out of time. We have barely 15 minutes left and I've got about a question, um, an armful of questions, so we won't have time. But I wanna keep you on the hot spot, Dr. Zara. Is that enough? It's just going back to what we had enough. Is a Biden administration just, just putting those 0.00 whatever percentile of nothing that you mentioned, is that enough? How do no. we make sure that we galvanize in this moment, in this shift of administrations if it were to happen, um, to make sure that, 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 that these things are progressed, to make sure that Dr. Lena doesn't have to come on another panel and say that it is humiliating, she said, to, to have to go with bowl in hand. So how can we how can we make sure that, I mean, pending the, the election and the results um, and a second Trump term, that's a different set of circumstances, but, but if it was a Biden, if it was a more amenable administration, is continuing with what we have enough? And I ask you that for one reason, because I'm gonna go around hopefully again with another sort of a, a quick fire round. We need to make sure that this money is ending up in the hands of people like Catherine, ending up in the hands of people that Dr. Lena works with. Uh, so how can we make sure that the money is actually getting there and that there are more resources in the first place? How can the US help that? Yeah, absolutely. To your question, is going back to where we were in 2016 enough? Absolutely not. As I've said before, things were bad before. We had this huge unmet need before. Millions of women were dying before. So clearly that's not enough. The numbers that I just gave you, that commitment of 1.66 billion would be helping the US helping get to 100% coverage, right? 100% of maternal health care, 100% of newborn care. I'm not looking at like a 50% is good enough situation. We have to have universal access, universal care. So absolutely, that's where we have to be. Is restoring and getting back to where we were with WHO and UNFPA enough? No, absolutely not. We have to escalate and step up our leadership and commitment there. And growing that pie and taking away all of these, uh, the legislative architecture that supports the targeting of reproductive health. So the Helms Amendment, um, the global gag rule, still gender, Kim Kasson, there's this whole architecture that keeps undermining reproductive health and reproductive health programs. That has to go too. I personally spent 10 years inside CDC working on global health, largely in countries implementing programs. There are absolutely ways to get money directly to ministries of health, directly to local NGOs. And we can do that if these political shackles are removed from the people who know how to make evidence-driven scientific programs happen on the ground. More reason for, for Sarah to set up this Women's Rights Foreign Policy Department. I cannot stress enough how much I like this idea. Let's come to you, Sarah. How have abortion laws that have liberalized in many low middle income countries in recent years, we have seen a shift towards that direction. How has that been affected by the global gag rule? It's interrupted so much of the hard work that you guys have all done in the space. And I say this for one reason, it is hard rolling up a ball up a giant hill. It's even harder to be expected to stand still on that thing, carrying that boulder on your shoulders. And that's what's being asked of, 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 the, of this um, sexual rights movement. So I ask you again, how has this global gag rule interrupted this uh, more progressive abortion laws that we've seen in low middle income countries? Well, I think one of, one of the, I mean, there were many disturbing things about the expansion and reinstatement of the global gag rule. But one thing is since the 1984 International Conference on Population Development, when the governments, including the United States government committed to sexual reproductive health and rights agenda, since then 
we've had more than 40 countries liberalize their abortion laws. So you have Colombia, Uruguay, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Malaysia, Cambodia. So there's a whole list. So, so in for 2017, for the Trump administration to then, they were acting like it was 1984 when the, uh, you know, so during that, so that my point just being the world has moved forward. Countries have responded to issues that, that um, Dr. Ahmed was talking about in terms of maternal deaths and, um, you know, unsafe abortion. So countries coming up with their own local responses to the issue of maternal death. And, um, and this is, again, an example of the United States government coming in as, as a so-called white savior of I don't know what, um, to really impose its ideology and its anti-woman agenda on the countries. So in a country like Mozambique that changed its abortion law in 2014 to respond to deaths from unsafe abortion, they liberalized their laws. They were getting ready in 2017 to issue the guidelines and get everything you know, rolling. And then the organizations and the country is hit because it's not just the organizations getting US funding. This does impact the ministries. It's that chilling effect. Um, you know, the global gag doesn't is not supposed to apply to governments, but we, with the U.S. government having such a heavy hand and having so much money, um, that you have organizations that are scared to even talk to the ministry to get to advocate for those guidelines to educate the people about the change in law, and this is. Such a, I mean, talk about the U.S. government's always talking about sovereignty. I mean, this totally goes against sovereignty. And again, it's interfering in countries and communities coming up with their own solutions to their public health challenges. And then the U.S. government steps in and interferes and stops and people die because of it. So then let's move to Catherine Osata. How do domestic policies impact sexual and reproductive health rights and access, which we've just heard from Sarah, is almost overburdened by this sort of um, strangely pseudo diplomatic uh, uh, sort of world that we live in when it comes to global international aid, especially within women's sexual rights. How does domestic policy um, treat it? Okay, uh, let me say, uh, I'll, and Sarah has said something uh, good that uh, this policy should not uh, control the governments, but we see uh, the governments are being controlled and. Uh, in indirect because you find uh, a case in Kenya where the, the, the court saw this and uh, it ruled out on the restatement of the standards and guidelines on the maternal health in Kenya. And you find up to date, the Ministry of uh, Health in Kenya has not been able to implement as much as even the organization are pushing for it. But there is something that the government is fearing uh, to make this uh, policy to be implemented. So I can say uh, indirectly, the governments are being impacted and narrowly it narrows down to the women who wants to access the services and because the policies cannot be implemented, now the women cannot access the services fully. Um, before we, uh, we've only got about seven minutes here and Dr. Lina, I wanna come to you, but I wanna tell you my final question so you all can have a little moment to think about it. And the final question is a big one. It's been hard to, to, to say the least over the last, last four years to see the domestic American policy and the way that women's rights has been treated in, in states up and down the country, including the just truly atavistic laws when it comes to accessing abortion and accessing women's rights in places like um, Georgia um, and, and, and other states around, around that area. I want to know from your perspective, is there any way that we are going to be able to get back on track or has a generation of young women now been adversely affected? That is to say, has the last four years of this administration left scars on this movement? So I'll just leave you with that to think about, but Lena, I want to come to you if you've, if you've got a couple of moments. So. As, as someone who kind of works between these two realms of the macro and the micro, what are the challenges that you face and you assume that you will face in the near future uh, for local partners, people who work in that space? 
Absolutely. Well, I mean, to answer a part of your question, you know, will we deal with these scars for, for generations? Absolutely, we will at the national level. I mean, now we've got a Supreme Court justice who is in direct opposition to everything that we believe in. On the international level, Sarah, you mentioned ICPD, and I was there in Nairobi for the 25th anniversary, where we were called upon to fulfill the promise that, well, you know, if we haven't fulfilled it yet, that's a broken promise. And we continue to break our promise over and over again to women. And we're reduced to begging for us to our own bodies and lives. And I think that it is just a repeated crime. So for local organizations, it's the same type of story. It's the fight for funding. It's the rhetoric that we hear on one side, not matching the reality on the other. It's, you know, countering this new buzzword that we've got, you know, localization. Well, you know, really happening. Let's call upon donors to say, are you really channeling money to women-focused, women-led organizations and letting them do what they want with it uh, that is unrestricted, operational, long-term, meaningful? I mean, these are the organizations, these local groups who've been there long before the international community belatedly discover these issues in these countries and will remain long after. And we continue. I mean, now we've got COVID and now we've got so many other things. It's like nonstop, you know, tyranny of the urgent, as they say. So I wonder, you know, when are we going to see this as urgent? When will we actually take this issue seriously? Because I, for one, after now 25 years in this space, am baffled that as humans, we continue to struggle with a very simple concept that we cannot accept women as equals. And what, you know, what is wrong with us that we're not able to do that? And let me just end with one quick story that a young Arab woman um, asked me a question I, after I'd finished speaking, giving a presentation, and she said, do you think that in my lifetime, I will see um, women's rights be a matter of fact and not a matter of fight? And I thought, oh, well, there you have it. You know, I said, I certainly hope so. I'm working for you to see it in your lifetime, but it's getting harder to be optimistic. Don't worry, I have bounds of it. So I will, I shall channel some directly to you and put some in your account there, Dr. Lena. I hear the urgency. Well, I shouldn't say that because of, of, of the tyranny of the urgency, but I hear the urgency in your voice and I can, I can tell that this, this call is one that's hoping to, to get us all energized and invigorated to actually make sure that we, we don't back down. There is, in my mind, no other purpose but for success for us because none of you not in your 25 years experience, your 20, your 10, your 15, and, and all of our lived experiences as women, we have no choice but to succeed. So Dr. Zara, let me come to you with that level of optimism. What do you make of this idea? Has this movement been left with scars that it's not going to heal from? Are we scarred? Yes, because policy has consequences. It's not a game. It's not about rallies and speeches. It is about real people's lives and policy leaves real marks. But just because we're scarred doesn't mean we don't fight back. And not back to the bare minimum, but fight back for far beyond what we deserve, what we need, what we are entitled to, not just what we are willing to accept because it was what we had before. And I am really optimistic because look at how the policy conversation has shifted for reproductive health, but also how it shifted for other movements like climate and immigration. They have not just asked for what it was before, but asked for so much more. And I truly believe we can make change, especially if we harness all of the energy pouring in at this moment over the longer term. Sarah, I'm going to come to you next. What do you make of it? Can we can we heal from these scars of this Trump administration and these this, these bad leaders? I think I think we can. I think in in our, our movement, our field of sexual reproductive health and rights, women's rights, there is so much resilience that we've seen over the past four years. And I wanna say that on top of compounding what we've been experiencing with the Trump administration here in the United States is a real reckoning and a spotlight on racism and anti-Black racism. And I think for those of us in the US who are working on global sexual reproductive health and rights, we're having a reckoning internally in our organizations, in our coalitions, and how does this, we, how does the racism that we are enmeshed in impact the work we're doing overseas? So we have, so I am, I'm hopeful because I think there's a lot of energy from young people, young, especially young women of color in our movement who are holding those of us who are white leaders to account 
I think in the coalition spaces that are predominantly white, making decisions about policy, strategy, and agenda that impact mostly brown and black women and girls overseas, that we have to have our own brain. How are we gonna make sure that we are held accountable that what we think is a really good policy solution might be really bad and not answer what the, the women and girls that Catherine works with. How, how do we bring them into our conversation to come up with these policy solutions? And I think that's the future and that's how it's gonna change. Doing my job for me there, Sarah. Uh, let's move on to Catherine, you get the last word. Yeah, um, I will say uh, what Sarah has said, giving uh, women and girls the space to come and air their views and say what they want and say which policy works for them well and which one doesn't work will really make us push forward. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, those of you watching this webinar, scarred, battered, bruised over the last four years, we march on because we have no other choice but to succeed. There is only one path for us and that is success. My greatest thanks, appreciation, not only for being on the panel, but for teaching me so much goes to Lina uh, Abderafa, Sarah Sippel, Dr. Zara Ahmed and Kathleen Oseta. We are so grateful to you. I am grateful to you guys who are watching for your time. I hope you've learned something that you didn't know before. And Women in Dev, thank you for letting me moderate this discussion. Can bad leaders incite good change? That is all that we have. Thank you for watching. Thank you.